today we're starting a brand new series, which actually is a great, this is a great jumping off point. Because today we are starting a series called Walking in the Light, and it's based out of 1 John, the epistle of 1 John. So I need you to understand, John, the, John, the disciple John, not John the Baptist, John the disciple. The Bible says the disciple that Jesus loved. He's the writer of the Gospel of John. He's the writer of Revelation, and he's also the writer of these three letters, John 1, John 2, and John 3, that we find in our Bibles. We're going to deal over the next few weeks with 1 John. So 1 John is a letter that he writes to the general church. You you need to understand, there there are different types of letters. They're called epistles. All of them are called epistles. A letter written by an apostle to the church is an epistle. Some are focused to general churches or to specific places. Uh, Some are focused like the, the, the book of Ephesians is a letter written by the apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus. The, the book of Galatians, written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Galatia. But what we have here in 1 John is we have three letters that are what, what are called general epistles. So this is written to the general church. So everybody hear me. This is written to us. This is written to speak to us, to teach us, to help us understand how to best follow Christ. Now, we just came out of a series that was called Salt and Light. As we look into 1 John, what we're going to find is we're going to find patterns and helps for walking in the light. Because what the Apostle John is doing in this letter is he is specifically specifically targeting new believers, people who are new in the faith. And I'll show you some of that as we go forward. He's specifically targeting people who haven't quite yet figured out what this is. They know Christ has saved them. They know their life has changed. They know they believe in Jesus. They're just not exactly exactly sure how to walk it out. And let me point something out. As the apostles are writing their letters that we now have as part of our New Testament, as those letters are being written, they are developing theology. You you should not allow yourself to get into the thought space that somehow they had a seminary or they were trained in some college or that none of that was there. These are Jewish, well, in, in Jesus' case, a carpenter. In Peter's case, a, a fisherman. Peter, James, and John were fishermen. Matthew was a tax collector. These are not even really Jewish rabbis. They, they, in Paul's case, you have, a, you have a Pharisee who was a rabbi. And so you've got these, these Jewish people trained in Old Testament Jewish Judaism as their religion. But now there is Jesus. And y'all, Jesus changed everything. And so now they've got to help people understand what does it mean to follow Jesus? What does it mean to walk in the light of Christ? And so he's beginning to answer that question. And John specifically is focusing in on speaking to those who are new in the faith. Now, watch what he says. Well, I'm in John chapter 1, verse 1. He says, that which was from the beginning. I, I want to pause. And I want to pause here because what what I want you to understand is this is kind of the same way he starts his gospel. In his gospel, he he starts out by saying, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. So this word, logos, that is capitalized, this word, means Jesus. He's speaking of Jesus, and he, he starts his gospel out by saying Jesus was there from the beginning. He also starts this letter saying the same thing. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, which are with our eyes, which we have looked at with our and our hands have touched. This we proclaim to you concerning again, this word logos, the word of life. That is Jesus. He is speaking of Jesus and he's wanting to say to them a couple of things. First of all, Jesus is from the beginning, but don't get all caught up in his divinity because he is also that which we have heard, which we've seen with our eyes, which we've looked at and our hands have touched. He says this, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us, and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. I want you to hear me. What he is saying to them is something that they will unpack, that Christians will unpack for the next couple hundred years until it gets solidified. He's saying to them, this is Jesus 
who physically was with us. We have seen him. We have looked at him. Our hands have touched him. We know him to have been here and to have been real. What we also proclaim to you is that which was from the beginning, that was which that which was with God from the beginning, that which was the life that has been sent by God. It is eternal. He is laying out for us something that the church will wrestle with for a couple hundred years, but we now see what they have dealt, they've come to, which is Jesus is both God and human. You said, well, wait, 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 what do you mean both? I mean, Jesus is 100. Now, is he 50 50? Is it, here, here, watch. Here's our problem. Often, when I say Jesus is both God and is human, people will hear he's like half of one and half of the other, or 65 45 or something. No, no. G, everybody hear me. Jesus is 100% God and he is 100% human. He is both. He is God. He is from the beginning. In the, in the gospel of John, he says, he says he was there when everything was made and nothing was made without him. He's been there from the beginning. He's always been uncreated, that which is the original creator, the original essence of all reality is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And Jesus was there for that. But he was also physically here. There were those in the first century that would teach that Jesus was not actual a physical human, but he was. He, he was here. He, he walked this planet. They had look again. We've looked and our eye. Our hands have touched. They've seen him with their eyes. They know he is testifying to what he experienced. Jesus was real. And I need you to understand that Jesus was real. And I need you to understand that Jesus is real. He always has been. He always will be. This is the God who was before anything else was. This is the God who walked among us in a given period of human time. And this is the God who stand, who, sit, who is seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. Jesus was, is, and will be. And by the way, is always in the present that's a whole nother place I need to go in scripture I'm not going to go there but look God always is it's not that God was it's not that God will be though God was and God will be it is that God always is in the present because he's omnipresent at all places at all times now why do I go through all that because the apostle starts with us by making us understand that the reality of God is is revealed to us in the person of Jesus. Jesus comes so that we might know the Father at a deeper level, at a better level. Everyone knew what had been said about the Father from Moses or, 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 from, or from the writers of the Old Testament or from Samuel or from David or from Solomon. Everybody knew what had been said of God, but no one had experienced God. And in fact, there had been 400 years of silence from heaven before the New Testament takes place, before John the Baptist walks out of the desert and begins to proclaim, uh, make straight the paths for the Lord. But in, in, when Jesus comes, Jesus is God incarnate is the phrase in the flesh. And we see him and we know him and we now understand more about God the Father because we have seen God the Son. When God visits us, he shows us himself. He reveals himself to us. And we're going to start out by saying it is his reality that is revealed. Now, jump down to verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Watch. It's not just the reality of God that is revealed. It is also revealed to us the nature of God. God is light. You can take this in all kinds of ways, but I want you to see something. Darkness, you got to hear me. You got to hear this out. Darkness is impossible in the presence of light. Where there is light, darkness cannot be because darkness can only exist in the absence of light. Light is not dependent on darkness. Darkness is dependent on light. It says that he, God is light. That means, let, 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 me, let me apply this a couple ways. That means wherever God is, 
there is no darkness because darkness cannot exist in the present. Y'all, come on now. There you go. God, 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 God is light. Not God shines light. He is light. God shows us himself and we see that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. Now you read these words, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Well, that's rude. No, 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 no. That's just logical. If you're walking, hey, watch. If you're walking with God, you cannot possibly walk, be walking in darkness. Just think about that just a minute. Some people are saying, well, well I'm going to stay over here in the dark, but I, I, I want to know God. You, you can't do those things. That, that, they can't coexist. So if I took it a layer deeper and I said, what if light was holiness and darkness is sin? God is light. God is holy. And in him, there is no sin at all. And if I'm walking alongside God, it doesn't mean there's no sin in me, it, but it means that that sin can't take root. It can't take hold. It can't get a foothold. Because God roots things like that out. Some, you know, I, I got to be honest with you. you. None of us are perfect. Everybody, I'm going to need an amen out of you. None of us are perfect. All right, that's true. However, however, we walk alongside a God who is. And the closer we get to him, the more difficult it is for the sinful habits and nature to continue to take hold inside of us. It's not like we'll ever become perfect on this side of heaven. Don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to say that. I'm just saying just like darkness flees from light, sin will flee from the holiness of God. The holiness of God will help us. Do you hear what he's doing? When he's talking to new believers, he's saying to them, the very nature of God himself will help to purify and lead and guide you. The very nature of God himself will help to sanctify you. His very presence will help to do that. I'm not, not everybody stay with me. Again, I got to be careful. I'm not saying that once you have God in your heart, you'll never sin again. I'm not trying to say that. But I am saying that having God in your heart gives you strength to overcome and begins to push those sins that once controlled you further and further away and they start losing their handle on you because you're suddenly under the control of something they have no control over. Do you see that? God is, God is showing us that His very nature is redeeming us, is sanctifying us, is making us whole and making us better. The nature of God is revealed. The, the, the reality of God is revealed. The nature of God is revealed. But listen... I, you got to understand, wherever God, look, okay, let me say it this way. God is real, and his nature is light, and he always gives us a command to follow because he's in charge. There is a command of God revealed. I'm in verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son. Watch, you got to see this. The blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. It doesn't say we never sin. It says it purifies it. Watch, he actually fixes it. It purifies us from all sin. If we claim we, to be without sin, we declare ourselves, we, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. So he's laying it out for us. He's giving us that, 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 that difficulty, that imbalance that seemed to happen. When we talked about the nature of God. If we, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live in the truth. Some people say, well, well, I sinned yesterday or I sinned or I did this or I did that. And all of a sudden we're, we're stressing out because I must not be walking in the light. But then he says, when we walk in the light, as he's in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus pure purifies us but don't act like you don't have sin you see the balance he's striking the command of God is to walk in the light of Christ it is not yeah everybody stay with me the command of God is not to be perfect the command of God is to walk in his light the command of God is to walk as closely in the light and the fellowship of Christ as we can and when we do that the blood of Jesus purifies us it washes us clean it, 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 we are still broken. That Y'all, I don't know any other way to say this except to say that the brokenness that entered us because of the sin of Adam and Eve, we can't blame them entirely because we've made our own choices, but the brokenness that entered us because of the sin of, sin of Adam and Eve will never depart from us this side of heaven, but it can be tamped down. 
It can be brought to light. It can be brought into the blood of Christ and redeemed and washed and purified from there. And then the light of Christ can help us to loosen the grip of it on our lives and our existence. You see what he's teaching these new believers in Christ? He's showing them that it's possible to walk differently. It's possible to live differently. And it's, and by the way, you know what else he's showing us? He sh- like, yeah, let me read it out. Let me go to the last one, verses 9 and 10. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I just got to stop. And even at home, you need to say amen. Because that's an awesome truth. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we've claimed we've not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Y'all, in this book, the reality of God, in just this chapter, the reality of God is revealed. The nature of God is revealed. The command of God is revealed. And I need you to hear me. The grace of God is revealed. There is this lesson that I've taught so many times. It's going to come up a lot in, inside this book. Grace is huge, but holiness is required. Here's the balance. Here's where that balance is found. The grace of God is massive. His blood purifies us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all. His blood does that. But holiness is required. You got to walk in the light as he is in the light. For God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. You hear the balance he's striking here? He's not arguing that once you walk in the light, you should never ever touch darkness again. And if you do, you're, God's going to strike you with a lightning bolt and knock you out of, out of hell. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that the light of Christ will purify us and guide us. The blood of Jesus will wash us clean. There's grace and there's holiness, both together. Here's my issue, and I, I'm just I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to tell a story. One of my issues with the church is holiness people. And, and I grew up in a holiness world. I grew up in a holiness church. Y'all, I got saved 593 times before I was 18. I mean, every time, every time somebody came to church and preached something and I felt something, I went to the altar because I was afraid I was going to go to hell. So I got saved all kinds of times, you know, because I grew up in my holiness tradition. There's precious little grace or at least precious little strong grace inside of a holiness tradition. But on the grace side, where a world, your actions have no bearing on your salvation. There's precious little holiness over here. Because if my actions have no bearing on my salvation, well, I prayed and I'm good. I literally went to a funeral service one time where I knew how this lady had lived her, her years and then she died unexpectedly. And I literally heard the pastor say when she was a teenager, she received Christ at a youth camp. So she's good to go. That's terrifying to me because I don't know if that's true. I, I, there, there's, where's the holiness? There needs to be walking in the light. I'm not really good at walking in the light. So there's grace. But I got to walk in the light because I'm called to. So there's holiness. They both exist. It was very interesting to me recently. I've been re- I've been re-listening to uh, Eric Metaxas book on, on Martin Luther. When Martin Luther became a, a monk, he um, he was he was so careful with his faith and, and so meticulous with everything that literally the, the 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 monk that was in charge of receiving confession from him would tire out because every day Martin would walk in with list upon list. I mean, it would be hours of him confessing sins. And, and the, the man that's listening to him is looking at him going, none of this qualifies as anything you should bring in here. And he says, but I must confess it all because, because you must. Con-. He's hearing this. If you confess your sins, he's faithful. And if I don't confess one, he won't forgive it. And, and, the, and the, the father that's with him is, is trying to help him understand that grace is bigger than that. But Martin can't figure that out because he lives in a very legalistic world. And it's not until he begins to understand some verses out of Romans that say it's our faith that has made us whole. That he begins to find some peace and say, you know what? I've been trying to confess to this human all this time when he's not the one that has the power to forgive me anyway. And the one that does have the power to forgive, stay with me, stay with me. The one that has the power to forgive me died on a cross to gain that power. 
No, no, no. Let me take it a step further. The one who has the authority to condemn me is the same one who died on a cross to save me. That means grace is pretty huge. But he also requires some things of us. It's not just grace. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just will forgive us. Amen. But we must walk in the light as he is in the light. When we do that, we have fellowship with one another and with Jesus. You see the two? This is the balance we're going to work at striking throughout the whole series we're walking into. And this is the balance I want to challenge you to work on this week. This balance between grace is huge. Walk in the light. I'm sorry. Grace is huge. God will forgive you. But holiness is required. Walk in the light. Let me pray for you. Holy Spirit, speak to us. Jesus, the fact you came, the fact you came to this earth and died on a cross for us is more than our hearts can contain or more than we could imagine. But then you died and you gave your life for us. You shed your blood that we might find forgiveness. And now you're arguing on our behalf. Oh, we, we could never, ever, ever repay you. And Father, we ask that through the blood of Jesus, you would receive us as your children. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, you would teach us to walk in your light. Lord, we attempt and we strive. Make us better at our striving. But where our striving stumbles, let your grace cover every, every stumble, every moment. And Lord, we will give you praise for all you do. Make us more like you. In your name we pray. Amen.